Thank you, everybody. Our next session is a conversation about Asia's security. We're going to have Derek Shearer, who is former U.S. ambassador to Finland and uh, currently is a professor at Occidental College. He'll be talking to Admiral Dennis Blair. Admiral Blair used to, used to be the PACOM commander. Um, he then became the director of national intelligence, and he now runs the Sasakawa Peace Foundation out of Washington, uh, D.C. And they're going to be talking about the overall picture of security in Asia, which kind of sets up a panel we have a bit later, which we're calling Submarines to Satellites. So let's go on with this, and we've got a long afternoon ahead of us. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for coming. As Terry told you, Admiral Blair has been one of our most distinguished naval leaders, and in addition to ending his career as the head of Pacific Command, he, has, he is, as far as we know, the only naval officer who water skied behind a destroyer. And uh, after serving in the Navy, he was head of the Institute for Defense Analysis, and then served as head of the National Intelligence Council in the early Obama years, and now, as Terry said, is head of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation in Washington, D.C. We're going to begin, I'll have an opening question for the Admiral, and then after he presents his remarks, I'll have a quick follow-up question or two, and then we're going to go to the audience and try and get in as many questions as we can for you. So, Admiral Blair, how has the security situation in Asia changed since you were head of Pacific Command in the late 90s? Well, thanks, uh, Derek, and thanks uh, for this uh, coveted right after lunch spot that uh, we have. I will attempt to keep you awake by uh, not scaring you too badly on what sort of terrible military disasters might occur in the, uh, in the half the world surface that the uh, Admiral Harris uh, descri described last night. But the, um, I was the uh, Pacific Command commander in 1998 to 2002, about, uh, about that period. When I would visit China and talk with my military counterparts in, in China, uh, they would tell me quite frankly that military modernization was still the fourth of four uh, modernizations at uh, at that time that they were uh, they were living on a uh, they were living on reduced rations as as far as uh, resources from the the government went. Now they were working very hard on doing a lot of thinking about what the role of the People's Liberation Army should be. It goes back to that uh, goes back to that saying uh, you know if you don't have money you have to think and the uh, PLA at that time was going through a very careful reconsideration of how they should transform themselves from the People's Army uh, that had fought uh, the Civil War in China and then the Korean War into uh, the kind of army, armed forces they thought they would need for the, for the future. But basically, they were not a force to be uh, reckoned with much in, in Asia at all. Uh, when I would travel to Japan and talk to my counterparts there, the top issue, the top issue between the United States and Japan, which was discuss discussed by everybody from the President of the United States down to sailors on ships, was the Shinkampo incinerator outside of one of our bases. There was just no strategic dialogue, uh, no, no strategic uh, thinking going on between these two strong allies. Japan was about halfway through the funk of of uh, stagnation of, uh, of, of 20 years and nothing was happening in, in Japan. So, you know, the United States was pretty, pretty much alone, unafraid, and uh, unchallenged in the, in the world at that time. And so what's primarily changed since those years are the tremendous development we've seen in the, in the security sphere, the tremendous development that we've seen in the development of the uh, People's Liberation Army living on 10% uh, uh, budget uh, increases every year from roughly the, the mid-90s until last year or so when they, when they throttled down some. And then uh, China and then Japan uh, coming back, uh, led by a prime minister who probably cares about uh, security matters as much as he cares about any 
any, anything and has driven uh, tremendous changes in uh, Japanese defense policy, Japanese defense spending, which has increased over the last five, five years, and the, uh, as we heard uh, earlier today, some of the interpretation of the very restrictive uh, Japanese constitution, which uh, the United States wrote for Japan back in 19, 1946. So the primary changes from the time I ran the Pacific Command to today when Admiral Harris uh, runs it is now China is a huge factor uh, militarily. Japan is a lot more active from a, uh, from a security point, point of view. And so the United States, uh, as the most powerful militarily uh, uh, country in, this, in that region, uh, has a completely different uh, set of circumstances to, to work with. I would say that the uh, objective that I had as a Pacific commander is pretty much the same uh, that the United States has now, is to take military matters off of the headlines, out of the headlines in Asia, get the military situation to be a relatively stable, behind the scenes set of incentives and, and deterrence uh, situations so that it's a relatively quiet part of the world from a security point of view. And so that the sort of economic dynamism, the political change, the cultural changes that we've seen in Asia over the last 40 years uh, can go on. But that's a much harder thing to do now with this change in the power relationships uh, which have happened in the last uh, 20 years. Um, Admiral, I know that you and certainly your predecessor, Admiral Fallon, and I assume many of the people who have followed you, have tried to find ways that our military can cooperate with the Chinese military maritime agreements, dealing with emergencies or natural disasters, ship visits. Um, could you talk a little bit about how that both works, but also is that effective in reducing some of the, not only misunderstanding, but misunderstanding about goals? I, I would say that uh, contrary to uh, most popular opinion, military to military uh, interaction has very little to do with actually improving, uh, improving relations between countries or with making it uh, easier to handle crises uh, should they occur. Uh, the idea that the Pacific Command commander, in the event of a um, in the event of a clash between an American plane and a Chinese plane in the uh, over the South China Sea or the East China Sea, can pick up a phone, call his counterpart, and say, uh, "Sorry, sorry, Jean Lee, that was just a mistake. It, the pilot was a little out of control. Let's go back to uh, where we were." It's, it's just not not realistic. Uh, when I was the uh, commander in the uh, Pacific, uh, the EP3 uh, crisis happened when a a Chinese pilot who didn't know what he was doing ran into the outboard engine on a, on a, uh, a P-3 uh, aircraft, uh, killed himself, and nearly managed to kill the 20 uh, American sailors and officers who were in, the, uh, in, in, that, um, in, in that airplane. At that time, the, uh, our ambassador in uh, Beijing was my predecessor at the Pacific Command, uh, Joe Prier, who had made many visits to China, knew many uh, Chinese uh, uh, sen senior officers, and uh, uh, not one of them uh, returned a call, talked to him in any, in, in, in any way. In fact, the entire Chinese government froze for a period of about uh, 20 hours, uh, and then finally a channel was opened up, and, and that channel uh, happened. So th this business of uh, knowing the, uh, the other armed forces better uh, uh, in order to make crises more manageable, in my experience, simply, simply doesn't work. Uh, on the other hand, I'm all for uh, Chinese military officers getting out of, getting out of their little uh, boxes that they live in in China and getting out in the world and realizing that uh, the armed forces of the world cooperate in many ways. They have many common tasks that they do together. Uh, PLA officers are provincial in a very literal sense. They, they uh, join the armed forces in a particular military district, uh, which coincide generally with, uh, with, a, with a province. They go to the schools there, they have their assignments there, and it's not until maybe 20 or 25 years into their career that they move to Beijing, get a job on the, on the defense staff, that they may have some contact with the outside world, know, what, know what's going on in the, uh, in the world at large. So I think in general, 
The more China gets out with its armed forces, Navy usually gets out more than the Army, Air Force more than the Army, the, the, the better. But to think that that will, in and of itself, uh, bring st stability when the, there's overall a competitive or aggressive relationship is, I think, uh, is, is not what I see. Okay. Um, one more question for me before we go to the audience. Um, some strategic thinkers have suggested that the recent assertiveness uh, of the Chinese military, especially in South China Sea, is going to end up kind of having almost the opposite effect that the Chinese might hope because it's giving incentives, some could say, scaring other countries in Southeast Asia into suddenly wanting to be much closer to the United States, a particular example is Vietnam. But I wonder, you've now traveled a lot in that region. Do you see that happening, and how do you see that playing out? Absolutely, absolutely. And it's, it's, it's even true that, the, uh, that this current Chinese uh, game of islands in the, in the South China Sea is not really working at the military. Uh, level because uh, their general aggressive behavior and most notably this reclamation on seven islands which has made them uh, big and put uh, airfields and, and uh, logistics lay down areas and a good port into each of these uh, islands has, has um, led uh, the Philippines to offer the United States access to eight different uh, bases on their, on their mainland, some of which we used to uh, uh, we used to fly from in the past. Uh, Vietnam has offered a tremendous amount of uh, both naval and air access. Malaysia, the Mo Malaysia, the same. And from a strict military point of view, if you offer me 20 bases on land, well defended, of a country versus seven islands sitting out there as grapes, which are about, you know, a half an hour of serious work to reduce to to rubble, I'd say, you know, I'll take I'll take number one. Uh, that's not to mention the entire strategic consequences they, they're running, which is, which is sending the countries of Southeast Asia running to uh, the arms of the United States and Japan in, in a way that, uh, that uh, is quite different from the way they acted the last uh, 10 or 20 years. So China has managed to create not only a worse, um, a worse uh, military situation against itself in the China, China Sea, but a much worse strategic uh, situation. So, I mean, I, I go to Beijing, I talk to Chinese, and I say, you guys are generally pretty smart. I've, and I tell them what I just told you. I say, what am I missing here? And, uh, and uh, I, I, they haven't told me anything I'm missing yet. OK. Um, Terry, you have our question. Do you have a helpful assistant here? And if you could identify yourself, too. Thanks. Yes, my name is Ed Euling. I'm from Las Vegas. Uh, I'll tell you one thing you're missing. The uh, president of the Philippines called our president a son of a prostitute and uh, declared the other day that he was, uh, he's going to stay out of uh, the China's way there and, and he's going to side with China because, and, and highlight the past massacres in the Philippines by Americans and uh, it's, it's very likely that he'll align with, with uh, China. That means one of our three strongest allies in the world will be aligned with China. Well, I'd, I'd point you to two things that we've already heard in this uh, conference. Uh, Admiral Harris told us last night that uh, the, uh, these outbursts by the president have not been reflected in official Philippine government uh, actions. And number two, I think we were shown this morning by the Pew data that the uh, United States is, is popular to, what, 90% with uh, Fi the Philippine uh, population. So I, I don't think that the latest uh, public uh, statement by the Philippine president is going to run the policy of that, uh, of that country, which is so clearly subject to other, uh, other, other forces. I don't want to get in debate with you. Come back in a year, we'll have a bet. Uh, Admiral Blair, was there another microphone over there? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, Admiral Blair, the, um, you know, there's been a lot of analysis. Uh, Hugh White is saying the U.S. is better back off in the South China Sea or there'll be a war. Others are saying that you've got to cede some ser territory to China. Um, you know, Xi Jinping has declared the nine dash line, which used to be 11 dashes, but they got rid of a couple. Uh, nine dash line to be, you know, that they own it. It's a core interest and they're, and they're not backing off. 
Is there a deal to be done on, on, on the U.S. and China on, on free navigation, but giving China something of what it wants? Or where does this lead to? Because we have a, a, a global navy and we're deploying more into Asia, but China's building its navy very strong and they're putting them all right down there. So it, it, you know, for a layman who lives in China for many years and has been watching this, are, are we, it, could this end up leading to conflict or is there a, a smart way out? I think there's a very low probability that uh, the bumping and grinding that's going on in the South China Sea will lead to uh, uh, to conflict. Um, if you look at if you look at East Asia from uh, the north to the south, it's just littered with uh, unresolved island territorial disputes. The northern territories between Japan and uh, Japan and Russia, on down to to Takshima Dokdo between Korea and um, and uh, and Japan down to the Senkakus and all the way into the end of the South China Sea. So this, uh, these uh, uh, islands that are claimed by more than one country are a pretty common uh, phenomenon. So how, how have they been handled around, the, uh, around that region? Now there's one category in which it's uh, neither country or none of the th three countries is giving up any territorial claim, but it's pretty well understood that there's not going to be any fighting over it. You either let time go by or you, ne you negotiate that. And I'd say, um, you know, certainly the Northern Territories fall in that case, Takshima, Dokdo falls in that uh, case and so on. Then there's a second, then there's a second set of uh, disputed territories in which a military balance has been set up so that aggression doesn't pay to try to assert your, um, assert your uh, sovereignty because you might lose and, and therefore, uh, you look at other ways to solve it. I would say the big island of, of Taiwan falls in that uh, category, and the, the half island of, uh, of Korea, the peninsula, uh, falls in that, uh, in that, in that category. Uh, and so those first two categories are relatively stable. The third category, uh, which applies to these islands uh, in, the, in the South China Sea, is that there are military threats, uh, there is a possibility that force would be used, and for, in fact, force be, has been used in the South China Sea. There was a there was a war over the uh, Paracels in 1979 between Vietnam and uh, and China, in which China took over uh, several of the uh, of, of the islands. Uh, so there's a possibility of uh, military conflict, uh, but a military balance in that particular area has not been set up to make it uh, worthwhile. So I think. What has to be worked out in the in the South China Sea is either one of those two ways that that region has found to uh, has found to put uh, island potential conflicts uh, in, into the background, and I think that's what you're seeing in all of the maneuvering that's uh, that's going on. A relatively uh, clever uh, Chinese strategy when they use uh, commercial forces, uh, paramilitary forces like coast guards and fishing. Uh, enforcement, uh, economic, uh, legal warfare, when it's, as it was used fairly cleverly by the Philippines uh, recently, a lot of shows of force around around the region. So the region is sort of bumping and grinding its way uh, its its way through. But I think that um, I think that a way uh, will be found to come up with some sort of a, uh, a situation in which uh, it, it doesn't occupy this uh, sort of triggering mechanism that it uh, that it has now. As far as the American uh, interest in it, uh, in it goes. Uh, what the main thing that we care about has to do with our ability to operate our military forces in that region, as we have for uh, you know ever since the Spanish-American War of 1898, uh, and that and we've done many times uh, since. The uh, and we've been a little bit unclear on that in the past because we've said freedom of navigation is what we're interested in. And then the Chinese have said, well, oh, we're not going to interfere with those uh, millions of container ships that go through there. They go to China. What we mean by freedom of navigation is the freedom to use our military, uh, primarily air and, air and uh, naval forces uh, there. And China uh, has a very restrictive idea of, uh, of uh, the rights of, a, of countries within its EEZ. And if China were to turn South China Sea into its own EEZ, it would attempt to uh, restrict American military um, uh, operations, and we're not going to stand for that. So that's really the core issue, but I think uh, that can be worked. Now, Admiral 
I don't want to neglect Amazon and South China Chi. The role of another emerging power, that's a re-emerging power, which is India. And when Ambassador Menon, who's here with us at the conference, was speaking with my students at Occidental, he talked about how relations between China and India are actually really good. The border's well managed. They aren't having conflicts. And it also appears that U.S. relations with India are at all time, you know, high in many regards. But somehow nobody's talking about India and its security role. And so how is both as when you were head of Pacific Command, but now, how do you view the role of India? I think India's interests are sort of in concentric circles around India itself. And when they get east of the uh, Strait of Malacca, they get pretty ten tenuous. You, you see the occasional thing like an Indian uh, Japanese uh, uh, exercise in the uh, Philippine Sea. That, that's more or less a uh, uh, a, a pretty small operation, uh, really. So I, I don't see India becoming involved in a serious way in these things that we're uh, that we're uh, talking about. I think their issues with China more have to do with the these uh, land uh, these land disputes uh, that we that you talked about. Yes. We'll do back, and then I'll come up to the front. Admiral, it, it appears that the window for a military solution with North Korea has closed. How do you see things developing relative to North Korea, and how serious is it? Is it, is it as serious as it appears? There are, I, I read carefully all of the ideas that very smart people have about uh, what we should do about North Korea. They generally have titles like, our policy has failed, and 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 uh, um, no one has a better idea than simply uh, containing Korea uh, both at the conventional level, which we have done quite effectively for for 50 years. Uh, they know that if they start a conventional war with the uh, combined forces of Korea, they lose they lose their lives, they lose their regime. It's all over. And at the nuclear level, where uh, when I was uh, when I was uh, in command, uh, North Korea probably had one or two nuclear weapons. Now they may have five or, five or 10. We have 1,600. It's not a survival move to use a uh, nuclear weapon uh, against either the United States or, or one of its allies. That's, again, the end of your, uh, the end of your regime, the end of your, end, end of your country. So I, I think that, uh, that uh, North Korea is is uh, rational, non-suicidal, and, uh, uh, and it continues to operate at this provocative level below, below the level of either starting something big, which would be a big conventional war, much less the use of uh, a, a nuclear weapon. And then, then, then it uh, tries to extract, uh, extract concessions for uh, stopping this outrageous behavior, which it itself uh, started. So I kind of see more of that in the uh, future, and I think uh, Nuclear weapons and more nuclear weapons put a put a sure j just by the law of uh, law of chance and averages a possibility of something even pretty bad happening involving uh, lots of lots of death and destruction. But I don't think it changes the basic uh, data there. And I haven't seen anybody who has a better idea on what to what to do about it. As for the Chinese um, role there, uh, you know, Admiral Harris last night said he thought China could do more. So do many others. That, I sort of imagine this conversation between the Chinese and the North Koreans, which Chinese friends have told me about, is in which the Chinese go to uh, North Koreans and say, stop what you're doing, or else we're going to take away the oil and the coal and the, uh, and the uh, goods that we, we trade with you. And, and the Koreans say, oh, okay, and then I'm going to fall apart, and there are going to be two million people across your border, and the, looks, and the nukes are going to be loose. Is that, how about them apples? And the Chinese say, well, um, I don't like those much either. And so I, I think... China's leverage to really force Korea to make a fundamental decision against something it considers in its national interests is relatively limited. So I think the key over the long run in Korea is try to um, cut them off from, uh, you, you can't have nuclear weapons threatening everybody and, and be part of the world economic system. That's out. You're going to suffer. Your people are going to suffer. If we're smart about it, you won't get the ice cream and the cognac and the dirty movies and all that you use uh, hard currency uh, for, but uh, that's, your, that's your choice. And then you're going to fall apart. 
when your uh, supporting elites realize what a terrible thing you're doing to your country and how you're the, you're the most benighted, uh, worst treated country in the world. I think that's kind of where we are. Our last best hope might be Dennis Rodman. Uh, up front here, I've been, I've been waiting on up front. Uh, thank you, Admiral. I wonder, there's been a, a, a bit of talk, perhaps loose, about the US drawing a so-called red line around Chinese construction around the Scarborough Shoal in um, the Philippines. Obviously, that the word red line has a particularly toxic recent history. Whatever you call it, a red line, a line in the sand, uh, the US saying to Ch Japan, uh, China, don't you dare do that or else. Could you um, uh, give us your response to that? I mean, should the U.S. be right. taking... I've been one of the ones who's, who's uh, been giving some of that loose talk. Uh, and I, uh, I think that... Um, <laughs> right, right. I, I think that... Uh, I think the Scarborough Shoals is somewhat different from the other 100 islands uh, that, are, that are up there. It was a... Uh, it, it was a base that, uh, it was an, a set of islands that uh, the United States used as a bombing range. I've fired shells at it, uh, friends have dropped shells on it, and we paid the Philippines uh, rent in order to do that. That's a pretty good uh, definition of thinking, thinking that they own it. We didn't pay China rent uh, uh, for it. It's located uh, quite apart on its own, 100 miles off of uh, northern, northern Luzon, right at the entrance of the Bashi Channel uh, coming in. So it would not be a good place for uh, China to have a military uh, garrison. Again, it would be only a few minutes work in, uh, in, in serious wartime, but, it's a, uh, but it's, a, uh, it's a good place to run surveillance and, and coercion operations from uh, short, of, short of war. So I think that uh, if the Philippines uh, uh, insist that that is a part of their territory and are prepared to do something about it, uh, and we'll see what their president uh, uh, thinks about thinks about that. Uh, I uh, I don't care if you think you're if you think you're uh, pro Chinese or pro American. You don't like your territory being taken away from you. Uh, I think if uh, the Philippines uh, do that, we should uh, we should support them. And I think it's a very favorable military situation. It's 600 miles from uh, the closest uh, Chinese base. It's uh, 100 miles from the closest Philippine bases that the Americans could use to support them. And uh, and to me, it's, uh, you're not taking much of a military chance if you, if you draw a line here. In the larger picture, I think that um, that would be a part of setting this sort of military deterrence in the South China Sea that, as I say, in other parts of, the, in other parts of East Asia has been successful in uh, having uh, potentially aggressor countries thinking of better ideas than military force and trying to go back to uh, economic, uh, econ economic power and influence. And I think it would be a good... Uh, I think it would be a good uh, step in that direction. Okay, it's our last question, gentleman Gray. Uh, uh, Dick Drobnik from the USC Marshall School of Business. Admiral, at the beginning you talked about the American spy plane being knocked down by an incapable Chinese pilot. And then there was 20 hours of silence. What opened the communication after the 20 hours? Can you tell us? Well, I mean, it was going to open sometime. <laughs> so it, uh, it was just a case of... Uh, the, it, it, it happened at a particularly unfortunate, uh, as these things always do. It was on the 1st of April. I remember getting a call from my command center and, uh, when, when it happened, and, and I, said, uh, I said, Major, I have a good sense of humor, but it's not that good. This is not an April Fool's uh, call, is it? No, sir, this really happened. So yeah, these things always have circumstances. But the other circumstance was that the... Um, that, uh, that Jiang Zemin at that time was actually stepping on a plane to go off to South America, as I, re I recall, to take, a, to take a trip. And the Chinese uh, crisis reaction capability was, uh, was pretty basic at that, uh, at that time. Uh, I th as I understand it, he gave his, uh, he gave his uh, instructions, say, uh, uh, call me when I land in wherever he was going to land, Peru or Rio de Janeiro. And, and so time went. So it took time for them to then get themselves or organized. And uh, once they get themselves organized, there was a, uh, there was a channel open to the embassy. Uh, things, went back and, things went back and forth. Uh, generally, the United States would get, give an answer back to a question from China within about four hours uh, any time. China would take about uh, another 12 hours to make it 
Interestingly, as a result of that, um, as a result of that incident, China established a crisis management mechanism, which sped up the cycle on their on their side. So, I think it was uh, primarily a um, uh, the delays were just uh, the Chinese government getting itself uh, getting itself organized. It was clear to me from a very early stage that uh, China, this was not the first step of China trying to attack all American uh, uh, military forces that were within range and actually starting a, a move on on Taiwan, that it, it was in fact a, a mistake by a, a pilot who who was carrying out what he thought the implied orders were and not the actual actual orders. So, um, and, and just to finish off, I think that's one of the things about the, um, about disputes that are in the air or or at sea is the, the data sources from those are all government official sources, so they're much more inherently controllable than our incidents at land, which can involve civilian casualties, in which you have people with iPhones, uh, iPhones taking them independent, uh, independent feeds that tend to inflame the nationalist uh, uh, and uh, and and um, tendencies, uh, making it difficult for leaders to uh, difficult for leaders to back down. So, again, I think the the uh, potential inc incidents in the South China Sea would be uh, unintentional. They would be controlled by uh, governments, and uh, there, there's very little chance of uh, big, big conflict breaking out there. We'll end on an optimistic note. Thank you very much, Admiral. Thank you all.